Hi, this is Matthew Cratter from Trader University. And today I wanna to answer the question, can oil prices go to zero? If you're interested in oil stocks, dividend stocks, or just wanna know how I'm trading this financial crisis, be sure to hit that subscribe button. So I've been getting questions from a lot of people. A lot of people are trying to buy crude oil here. And uh, when I talk to them about it, their response is always, well, at least it can't go to zero, unlike certain stocks. So I wanted to make this video to point out that uh, there are some weird things happening with crude oil. And it's actually, it could possibly be worse than people think. I thought this was a clever cartoon of crude oil, natural gas. Basically crude oil, we can see a, a yearly chart here. It uh, began the year trading in the 60s, high 50s and 60s, and has since fallen below uh, $20 per barrel. Now there are a few reasons for this. One is the sort of ill-timed price war between Russia, Saudi Arabia, and the US, Russia and Saudi Arabia trying to put pressure uh, supposedly on the US uh, shale oil producers. And this came at the same time that COVID-19 was really shutting down the global economy. I don't, I don't know about you guys, but uh, my wife and I have two cars, a minivan, a, Tah uh, a Tahoe, big SUV. Normally we have three kids, we drive around a lot. Uh, during the uh, during the week, normally fill up two or three times a week, and that that consumption of gasoline has basically gone to zero. Uh, we've been staying home, obviously, and so you have this combination, and you know we're obviously not the only ones. Combination of a huge supply glut of oil and very little uh, demand for for crude oil and for its products. If you think about how people are are not driving, airplanes aren't flying. Uh, factories are shut down, etc. So it turns out that crude oil, not only can it go to zero very easily, but it can go negative. And in fact, certain types of crude oil have already gone negative. Uh, this is a tweet from Dan Tapiero from a couple days ago pointing out that Wyoming Sour actually has already gone negative. Uh, and now this is not a, a super usable form of oil. And uh, as such, it trades at sort of a discount. But this actually, when the price of an oil goes negative, what it means is you're actually getting paid to take it off of someone's hands. You can see Wyoming Sweet just at $3 per barrel, Oklahoma Sour $5 per barrel, Canadian Western at $5 per bar barrel. This chart we're looking at here of the crude oil futures, these are actually uh, what are called WTI. Uh, futures, West Texas Intermediate. And these have to have specific, um, these have certain specifications. So in certain terms of sulfur content, specific gravity, the amount of sediment and impurities, etc. And then these, this uh, oil, if you're, if you're selling the crude oil futures and you want to deliver your oil to the buyer of the futures at, uh, at expiration, uh, you need to uh, you need to ship the oil. It has to have a certain quality. You ship it to Cushing, Cushing uh, Oklahoma. I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce it, and that's where these deliveries take place. Now, most of the futures don't actually go into delivery, uh, but it's important to know that there are different kinds and different qualities of oil. Now, it looks like right now Wyoming Sour has has rebounded, uh, but you can see the price, the year, the the change in um, or sort of the trading range for the year. For, for 2020, it's been as high as $43 a barrel and as low as $2 a barrel. Uh, and obviously some forms of it have been trading at uh, negative, negative, uh, negative prices. Now, it looks, uh, it's, it's possible enough that uh, crude oil and other energy products such as unleaded gas, natural gas, go actually trade at negative prices on the futures and the reason we know this is because the biggest futures exchange in the world, the CME Group, which bought the NYMEX, on which trades all these energy products like crude oil and nat gas, they're actually uh, reprogramming, this based on a Wall Street Journal article that was tweeted by Jesse Filder, they're reprogramming their software, their trading software, so that they can process negative prices for energy-related financial instruments, energy futures like crude oil, unleaded gas, uh, heating oil, and uh, and natural gas. So this shows that it definitely is within the realm of possibilities. Now there's so much oil that the U.S. government's trying to help out uh, 
I know Trump has said that he's filling up the uh, using some of this oil to fill up the the uh, the SPR, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, which is basically a uh, a, a, a reserve that the U.S. uses for emergency supplies, and these are big tanks in Louisiana and Texas. Once this gets full, though, assuming that the producers keep producing, and we'll talk a little bit more about why they might have to keep producing, you could have a real oil glut in a few months from now. And as such, uh, producers of oil and pipeline owners might, might actually be paying people to take the oil off their hands. Now, we've had negative energy prices in a bunch of markets. A lot of people don't realize this, so this shouldn't be too surprising, but every year, as I understand it, the price of electricity actually um, a few times a year drops below zero in California. And a lot of this is, is because of uh, renewable energy and sort of uh, uh, demand coming on and off. I don't understand the electricity market dynamics too deeply, but we do, uh, this is another form of energy where it, it that can actually trade at negative prices. Same goes for natural gas. So in the Permian Basin last year, natural gas prices actually went negative. Now, how did this happen? Well, basically you have a bunch of, or, or you used to, a lot of these companies are now going bankrupt, but you had a lot of uh, shale producers pumping gas, pumping uh, crude oil when crude oil prices were much higher. And one of the byproducts is uh, natural gas. And there's certain, there's certain uh, when the price of crude oil is high enough, it makes sense to continue to pump crude oil. And then you get all this natural gas that you don't know what to do with. You can try storing it, you can stick it into pipelines, but when you have too much of it, you actually do what's called flaring, where you light it on fire, which is just, uh, it's, it seems so sinful, it's hard to imagine. Uh, but that's what they've, that's what they've had to do or that's what they had to do last year where they were actually uh, burning or flaring the gas or paying, uh, paying people to take it off their hands, which is why uh, the natural gas prices went negative. Now, obviously these uh, producers, especially the shale producers, they have their own problems now with oil being so low. So there's less of this natural gas being flared. Uh, I should make a little footnote here actually that there are companies now that are working on uh, using this excess gas to drive Bitcoin miners, which is a fairly uh, a fairly nice way of, of using it. So you don't just uh, stick the gas in the environment uh, instead. But these are two examples of energy prices that have gone negative, electricity and natural gas. Now let's just look briefly at the, the math behind uh, crude oil prices going to zero or going negative. I'm sort of making these numbers up uh, but they will serve uh, as kind of an example. So let's say the market demand for a certain type of oil, whether it's Wyoming Sour or WTI, is currently $5 per barrel. This is obviously uh, where Wyoming Sour is trading. It's, it's a lot. Uh, crude, uh, the crude oil futures oil, WTI, WTI is trading at a much higher price. But assuming you get down here, this is how the math might work. If people are willing to pay $5 per barrel, which is just unbelievable. I mean, it's less than the price of a, a meal at McDonald's and it's less, it's less than certain types of bottled water even. Uh, but let's say the demand is only $5 per barrel from some manufacturer, some factory or refiner. And then let's say that the, the, the uh, and this market demand is obviously so low because we're still in the COVID-19 crisis. There's too much, there's this oil glut, etc. But let's say the cost to store this barrel of oil is $7 per barrel. Again, I'm, I'm really making up these numbers, but it will at least provide an illustration. And so if I sell these, um, if I store the, uh, store the oil, it's gonna cost me, let's say it costs me $7 per year. And so the, uh, the net result would be uh, a cost of negative $2. And so if I sell the oil at negative $1 per barrel, in other words, if you sell something in a negative number, it means you're actually paying the purchaser to take it off your hands. So I pay you $1 to take this barrel off my hands. I actually save $1 because otherwise it would be costing me uh, $2, uh, essentially essentially $2 per, per barrel to be stored in because the value is $5 and I'm sort of bleeding $7 per year to store it. And so by selling it at a negative price, I actually save myself some money. If any of you know a lot about crude oil and how this works, 
feel free to chime in in the comments uh, and uh, you can maybe provide some real numbers. But it makes sense uh, that this sort of dynamic would happen because you can't just, there are environmental restrictions, there are certain ethical things we would hope everyone would abide by. You can't just dump crude oil on the ground. You can't dump it, dump it into rivers or something. You actually have to store it. Now, the smarter thing would be to stop pumping it, uh, but that can be difficult, especially for some of the uh, oil sands companies. And uh, the, the, I'll link to this Quora article where they talk about uh, how expensive it can be to stop pumping, especially uh, the SAG, SAG, uh, SAG D type operations where it can take years to reheat the reservoir. So you're sort of forced uh, to keep pumping. You just can't shut them. Um, you can't shut them down, and there's certain costs as well to uh, uh, shutting down regular oil fields as well. So this is sort of the calculus that oil producers uh, have to do. Meanwhile, if we look at the crude oil futures curve, this is the CME group. Uh, we can see that we're not that far from zero. We're um, the front month, which is the the crude oil for delivery in May, currently trading about eighteen dollars per barrel. You can see the market is currently pricing in higher prices. So by the time we get to October of this year, it's pricing in closer to $33 per barrel. So what we have here is what's called a very steep contango, where the curve looks something like this. And this is the, the time axis here, and this is the price of oil. And so what's being priced in here is a recovery. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe it has something to do with summer travel, a lot of people driving and the demand for gasoline. It may also have to do with the the optimistic prospects that uh, the economies can be opened back up and everything will return to normal this summer. I don't I don't think that's going to happen, uh, but this is what's being priced in right now. So you could have a situation where one of these front months gets very close to zero or even goes negative, simply because there's a huge glut right uh, at the present moment in the front months. Uh, and then there's the idea that well demand will pick up and also at this point some of the producers will have gone offline the shale producers will be out of business and they won't be pumping anymore and so the market will come back into uh, supply and demand will be balanced a little more closely and uh, as a result the market will stabilize at at higher prices so this is the difficult thing about trading crude oil you can uh, you can have a, a view that crude oil is going to go higher but if, for example, you're going to be buying the October or the September uh, crude oil of 2020, you the, a recovery, a price recovery is already being priced in, and so you have to have the view that oil is going to go above 32.28 or above 32.98 in order to make money. This is how the futures uh, futures work. And uh, so, the good news about this is that even if the front month goes to zero or goes to negative. It doesn't mean that the stocks of oil producers or the oil majors particularly are going to go to zero. Now, I don't, I don't like these oil producers. I think it's not a great business to be in. There are a lot of problems. They have a lot of debt. ExxonMobil is actually borrowing money to pay its dividends, so it's not the blue chip that my uh, grandfather used to own. But just because the price of oil goes to zero in the short term, in these front delivery months, does not mean that these oil producers go out of business. It could mean that certainly the shale producers go out of business. Uh, since since they have a much higher marginal cost of production, uh, but some of these oil majors, you you don't have to worry that they're going to go to zero. Now they may perform badly, simply because going forward there's going to be more electric cars, less demand for crude oil, etc. Or maybe maybe we enter a, a, a very deep recession, etc. But just because oil goes to zero in the front delivery months, does not mean that uh, the oil producers go to zero. Now, my favorite oil stock, which I talked about in another video, is the Texas Pacific Land Trust. Uh, this is a, a great company simply because they don't have, they just get paid a royalty based on the oil that they pump or that the oil that other people pump for them on their land. So I'll, I'll link to that video if you're interested in an oil stock that I do like. I don't like Exxon. I don't like Chevron. Uh, I don't like Shell or any of these big producers, but I do like some of these uh, niche uh, land, tr land trusts. Uh, again, not an investment recommendation, but just uh, just what I like. Now, I want to conclude by talking a little bit about oil and deflation and inflation. So we've had a weird situation where we've had the, uh, the Fed and all the central banks just printing a lot of money to try to reverse uh, falling asset prices. 
And it's sort of interesting how this has, how this has played out, this money printing. Now we have not seen, we've seen actually quite deflationary results in the commodity markets. So I'll, I'll link to this below uh, in the description notes below, but this is sort of a, um, a chart or a table of year-to-date performance of different futures contracts. You can see the VIX has gone up a lot, obviously, because of stock market distress. Uh, fixed income is up, 10-year note, 30-year bond, uh, sort of a flight to safety. Gold is up, palladium is up. And you have some weird things like orange juice and rough rice are up. I'm not quite sure what to make of that. But for the most part, you can see that commodity prices are down and that we're actually seeing huge uh, deflationary pressures across the whole commodity complex. Now at the bottom here, we have uh, crude oil, crude oil, gasoline, uh, etc. The meat, live cattle, hogs. We have some stock indices in here as well, but sugar, lumber, it makes sense. Uh, housing construction, new housing construction slows, uh, demand for industrial metal, metals like copper or um, industrial uh, food products like corn when the factories close. Uh, when Kellogg's closes their cereal factory, for example, less demand for, for corn, for cornflakes. And so the immediate result uh, at the beginning of a recession is that you have this big drop in commodity prices. Now, the Fed's been printing all this money, but so far it hasn't made its way into propping up these commodity markets. Instead, it's made its way into the equity markets. We've had a big bounce in equities. Looks like probably running into resistance here at the 50-day uh, moving average. It remains to be seen how much they can, they can pump this. Uh, and you can see that stocks like TPL, which is the land trust the, uh, that we talked about, te Texas Pacific Land Trust, uh, its chart looks very similar to the S&P. Everything's fairly correlated. Uh, and where else is this money print printing gone? It's, it certainly hasn't gone, gone into crude oil prices. It's gone into the S&P. It's gone into junk bonds. Uh, JNK, because the Fed has said that they'll be uh, buying these, these high-yield bonds from uh, sort of bad companies, or highly leveraged companies, I should say. And then uh, they've also gone, the money's also gone into precious metals, like gold. Uh, gold trading near multi-year multi, multi -year highs here as well. And then uh, finally, I would say Bitcoin, which is really the digital gold. Uh, it's almost back to its break-even level for the year. And so definitely outperforming equities, outperforming commodities, etc. So these are the like the things I like to uh, look at to invest in. I don't currently own any gold, uh, but I do really like Bitcoin. Uh, and there's this impulse that people have to buy things like crude oil or natural gas, try, try to buy these physical commodities to get a sense of safety uh, in, in an uncertain market environment rather than owning pieces of paper. But as it turns out, that can be very, very risky, especially when demand uh, goes off a cliff. And so I prefer uh, scarce assets. Uh, there's only gonna be 21 million Bitcoin. The supply of gold is limited. Crude oil, there's a lot of it. And the more prices go up, the more people print, or, or the more people pump, I should say. And uh, Bitcoin and gold are different. When, when you have high prices, there's a limit to how much that can be produced. Bitcoin in particular, is uh, is going to have its supply cut in half beginning in the middle of May of this year, the so-called uh, May 2020 halving. And uh, as a result, it will benefit from, uh, from further central bank money printing that's trying to prop up the economy. So when I think of money printing and real assets, I like to look at really scarce assets like Bitcoin and gold and uh, steer, really steer away from things like crude oil which are so cyclical and so dependent on the global economy and how quickly it's firing. Now, if you found this video helpful and you're tired of uh, uh, Netflix binging, you're still stuck at home, check out my courses. I've got a great course here on Learn to Trade Futures Like a Pro, as well as uh, 12 other courses, uh, Swing Trading with Options, Learn to Trade Stocks Like a Pro. You can follow my Bitcoin and crypto investments as well. I give. Uh, visibility into my actual trading account there, one of my trading accounts. And I also have a course on uh, bear market trading strategies, which is quite useful in this sort of high vol uh, global uh, financial crisis trading environment. So if something that interests you, you've got, you want to work on self-education while you have this uh, time at home, 
check these out and um, I'll stick a link in the description notes below. It will take you to this page. You can click on any of these and see the uh, curriculum, see the list of lectures for each of these. Now, if you uh, subscribe, you get access to all of these courses for 30 days. You can just go down here and click get it now, which will take you to the checkout page. Now, normally 30 day tuition is just $125, gets you unlimited access to all the courses. You can watch all of them in less than 30 days and then cancel and uh, not be charged again. No long-term contracts or anything, but I wanted to give you a coupon code because we're in a uh, definitely in a recession here. So if you click down here where it says have a coupon code and you type in YT as in YouTube 99, click update and that will take the price down to just $99 for 30 days access. Take $26 off. Again, no long-term contracts or anything. You can sign up, watch whatever courses that interest you, take some notes and then cancel before uh, it uh, renews after 30 days. So check those out if you're looking for some online courses and you really want to learn more about how markets work. We're in an environment now where if you don't understand how futures and how stocks and how options work, uh, you're not going to be able to make any money. It's very easy to make money in a bull market, but we're definitely in a much more challenging environment. And I would, I would expect it to stay challenging for uh, probably 12 to, uh, to 18 months. So definitely check those out. Let me know your uh, questions and comments in the comment section below. Definitely let me know if there's a topic you'd like me to cover in a future video. And hit that subscribe and like button if you haven't done so already. Hope you guys are all doing well, staying well, and uh, I'll see you in the next video.